Another short chapter. Let's talk about basic construction. Basic construction. We're going to build a house. You're not going to build a house, but you should know what some of the parts of them are. All right. There's really not a lot in this chapter. There are some things that we're going to talk about. A contractor looks at costs. And if he looks at a, a ranch style house per square foot, a ranch style house is the most expensive to build. He's got to put a footer in there. He's got to put a foundation in there. He's got to put the roof on there. When and then he's got to build bedrooms and whatnot through there. But the most economical to build is what? A two-story, right? He builds a two-story. He still only has to put one footer in there, one header in there. He's uh, one roof on there. He's only got to put one foundation wall in there and build in two levels, right? He uses a little heavier contract uh, construction equipment. Right, maybe build some foundation walls a little bit bigger, but the most economical to build is definitely a two-story. Gets twice the twice the square footage, twice the square footage. And let's talk about this foundation. In the eastern part of North Carolina, we probably don't have too much. And the yeah. reason it, that would be a lie, we have to worry about a frost log. And the reason when it, we're putting the footings in on the building, we're digging down. This is going to be our point of growth, if you will. This is what we're going to build off of. But we have to get in there and we have to we have to find where that frost line is. Because if we don't build this below the frost line and that frost gets underneath our footings here, and these are footings, and the reason this gets underneath that footing, what's going to happen to that footing? And the, the reason is going to go up. Yeah, it's going to raise. And that's going to do what? It's going to damage your house. It's going to break your foundation. It's going to do all kinds of stuff. So we got to get below that frost line. Now, in the southern end, in the southeastern portion, you probably don't have much worry about that. We don't get a lot of deep frost. But if we go up to Boone and Blowing Rock and up near uh, Asheville or, you know, the northern ends of these of this state, up in um, Pilot Mountain, right, all of that area, they get frost. Wake Forest, they get cold. Neat. Those things get frost. So the frost line may come down a little bit. So we have to be very aware of how low the frost line is because this footing has to be built below the frost line. All right. So that's really important. And that's the bottom. That's our bread and butter right there. All right. It's called the footing. And that's what we're going to build everything off of. The second thing we're going to have to look, do is our foundation walls. So on these footings, we're going to build up. Right, And that's what this wall is all about. This is our foundation wall. And this area down here would either be a crawl space. Most case, a lot of cases, it's on the slab. right? But in this case, it's going to have a crawl space or a basement in there. But these are foundation walls. So this is where all we're going to nail all of our wood to eventually. Now, if you notice in the middle of this big open space, we have these things called piers. And the reason if I'm going to run a floor joist from this wall here to this wall back here, isn't that expanse just a little too large? Right? What would happen to those floor joists if I left them out there? Sooner or later, they would just start to sag, right? They would just fall in. So we're going to run a steel girder probably between that wall and that pier. So it sits on the pier just for support. So that's what those piers are for. All right? That's what those piers are for to support the footing. So the foundation sits on the footing. The foundation walls rest on top of the footing, right? And the piers support the flooring. That's what they do. They act as center posts in that flooring. And the reason, and the so reason we have some important parts of this house are framing. And we're not going to get into all of them. I just need you to understand a couple of them. The first one, let's start at the very, very peak of the house. At the peak of the house, where the two sides of the roof come together. And the reason... Right? Yeah. Thank you. Hunter just put in a pretty big clue there. Where the two sides of this house come together, that is called that board that goes in between. It holds those two together. That's called a ridge board. That's called a ridge board. Okay? It is not part of the soffits and fascia boards. It's not part of the footing. It is at the peak of the house. It's where the two sides of the roof come together. Right. And that is where the ridge board is. See it right there. And the reason now, coming down a little bit, 
we run into what's called the eaves. The eaves hang over. They're cantilevered, all right? Call a cantilever to hang over. All right, so, and most houses have one of these. It keeps the water running off, and you have a little space underneath there. Well, this whole thing, and the reason, and the reason this whole bit here is the eave. Okay, that's the eave. And the reason there is a little board here that kind of joins the roof coming down and the soffit going across. At this point here, that is a fascia board. F a s c a c i a, a fascia board. It's a flat board that goes across. Look at it tomorrow. You probably never even paid attention to it. It's out on your house. All right. Your roof comes down. It's going to get nailed into the fascia board. The um, soffit that's underneath it is going to get nailed in. That's the support that keeps that eave up. All right. right? Underneath here. So the fascia board is that board here. And this the reason it, that flat board. All right. This is the roof line up this way. Underneath here. And the reason it, where all your um, wasps and bees hang out. And the reason it's called your soffit board. Okay. This is a soffit underneath here. Now, some of them are wood. Some of them are uh, vinyl. Depends on when the make of the house is and what it is. All right. It lets that roof area breathe a little bit. And it kind of works as a um, uh, just holding that piece support for the piece on the roof to come back in. All right. So usually there's some ventilation in there and what have you. Um, I know that some of the southern states, some down south, if you go to Key West, underneath these soffits, they're painted blue. And the reason they're painted blue, I believe, is because the bees get the confused and they don't go in there to live and they think it's just sky. So they can't tell the difference between this powder blue and the sky. So they don't, they kind of keeps the termite, the, the wasps and the bees away from underneath the soffits. Um, if you have soffits, you got you got bugs. You're gonna have that's where they live, right? Your carpenter bees and all that other stuff. And the reason so you try to take care of them the best you can, right? And just be careful not to get stung. All right. So your soffit is underneath, and okay, the reason soffit's it, underneath, and the reason it, and that board is nailed. There is your sheathing on your outside of your house here, right? Well, there's got to be a junction here, something that's gonna hold that soffit. And that, and the reason uh, that sheathing, and the reason so it, there is what's called a freeze board, and the reason and that, that freeze board is that third component. So your three components of your eaves are going to be your fascia board, going to be your soffit underneath, and it's going to be that freeze board. Those are your three components of your um, eaves. Okay. And the reason, and the reason, it, so just FYI, your ridge board is not part of your eve. I don't know where I heard that question before, but I'm just kind of saying it out loud. So that is your three fit a fascia board, a soft board, a freeze board. Now, let's go back to what we were talking about before, though. And the reason, right? it, let's go back. Let's talk it. We, we dug these footings here. And the reason it, underneath the frost line, right? Down as low as we can get. And then along the front edge of the house, we built, around the edges of the house, we built these footing walls. All right? Now, this sill here, and the reason is a piece of wood that's going to go along the top of that foundation wall. Now, we're going to put it in. We're going to attach it directly to that foundation wall. We're going to use, you know, whatever type of materials we decide, concrete screws, and bring them together. And that's where we're going to do the nailing. All of our stuff works off of that sill. That's the lowest wooden part on your house. All right. The sill is the lowest wooden part um, as far as horizontal component. And that's underneath. That sits on top of the foundation wall or sits on top of the pier. Um, anything that's blocked underneath. Okay. So that's what we're going to work off of. Right? So at that point, we just start building and the, the reason joists across it. Right. And then build up. Now, on the other side of it, remember we showed those piers, the ones that were going to support the floor. Right. They were kind of in the middle. Well, here's our pier right here. And the, and the reason right? it, we're going to put a sill on top of that pier. And then in most cases, newer construction, they're going to run a girder across the expanse. 
In most cases, it's steel. And right? the reason it's it- not going anywhere, it's not bending. Some, pay, uh, some places still use heavy lumber, but a lot of places will use a steel beam and run it across the leg of the house. It keeps the floors from sagging. But it sits on those piers. You, you remember the pictures of the piers we looked at? And the prior. reason it- these piers here, on top of them, they're going to have all of this is going to have a, um, a sill board, and on top of this is going to have a sill board, and then we're going to run a steel girder across the year, all right, to make sure that this floor doesn't sag. And the reason, and the reason. Now, Another thing I want you to know is a header board, a header board is not up here, okay? And the reason- A header board is not up here. A header board is if I have a door, and I'm sorry that my door is not perfect. And the reason- There is going to be a board on top of it for support. And the reason- and on your doors and windows, you will have a um, like a two by twelve or something, a big strong piece of wood, maybe multiple two by sixes, that will be on top of your doorways, on top of your windows. That is your header board. It's not up on the roof. It's not up in the ceiling or anything else. It's above the doors and windows. That is what you want to remember. All right. So what you need to take away from this slide. The three parts of the uh, eave are the fascia board, the soffit board, and the freeze board. And the reason it- the ridge board is at the very peak of the house. It's not part of the eave. And the reason it- the header is not part of that. It, it belongs to the top of the doors and the tops of the windows for support. And the reason right. it- and the, the reason base, it- you have the footing and then that foundation wall and then uh, the piers hold for support. And you would put the lowest wooden portion is a sill. And the reason- For a little tiny chapter, that's probably about three questions on the test. So mark this slide in your notes. Make sure you know particularly those things we talked about, these things in particular. And the reason- And the reason- And the reason- So we just talked about all these, right? Joists, the floor joists, the eaves, the sill, where it is. Sole plate, all right? The sole plate is going to be at the bottom- that's your base when you're putting up your two by fours when you're going to put up your studs. You got to nail into something on the bottom. That's just the sole plate. Top plate is what you're nailing into up on the top. Again, I wouldn't worry too much about those, but it's nice to know. Right. And then I just explained to you what the header was. I told you I could do chapter 16 relatively quickly, 13, 16, 18. 18 takes a little bit more, but that's all good. That's all good. And the Somebody reason mentioned it, earlier capital gains, and we're going to discuss capital gains when it co- in the uh, when we get into this chapter a little bit. We sell our house for a lot of money. Let's say I owned this house for twenty five years and I bought it at a hundred thousand dollars. And the reason, it, and now with all the the rush and everything else, I'm going to sell it for eight hundred thousand. And the reason it, that may not be real, but let's use those numbers just to make me amused. That means that when I sell it, I'm going to make a lot of money on it. And the reason Do it, I want to pay 20% of that money to the government? And the reason it, they give us what's called a ca- capital gains uh, exemption. And there are some rules. And that's where we're going with this. Okay. We're not going to pay the full freight of tax on this if we can't, if we don't have to. A couple of things that we'll talk about. We'll tend to talk about a 1031 also in this chapter. All right. So. And the reason we as homeowners are, we have a lot of tax deductible expenses. And this is why you've heard me say a couple of times in the class that if you're in in real estate, you're in politics. For all of the reasons that are listed on this PowerPoint, this is all political. Home mortgage interest, you're getting ready to do your taxes on first and second loans, right? You can take off, you can deduct those. Discount points, you can deduct. Uh, Prepayment penalties, you can deduct. And the reason fees you can deduct. You're, if you're paying MIP, you can deduct them off your taxes, right? Your real property taxes are deductible. All of those things. Now, and the reason it, if a group of politicians decided that they needed to put more money in the general fund, if they took any of those away from us, would it hurt your industry? And the reason People it would buy less because it's not as beneficial anymore. So it certainly could hurt our business. So we're constantly fighting that battle that we don't want them to touch real estate. 
real estate is one of those things that we work really hard to get and to keep. And we want to keep all of these things. How much money? If they decided tomorrow that you could no longer claim your home interest uh, on your loans, and the reason how much it, money would they put in the general fund and new taxes immediately? And the reason, and the reason, millions of dollars. And the reason, of it, dollars. But, and the reason, would it be as an attractive an investment if you couldn't do that anymore? Would you go take out those big loans so that you could pay that, deduct that interest? No. So there's a trade-off for that. And so they don't want to really get into that. It's not something that they're interested in. But they could. They could. Wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't be much effort. And the reason... So it, we want to make sure that that's comfortable and they don't do that, right? All right. So we also have, on top of those benefits, and the reason we are selling our principal residence, the house that we live in, all right, our number one, where it says on our driver's license. And the reason... It, we're entitled to what's called a capital gain. And the capital gain is um and the reason and the reason I'm married and the reason jointly, if there are two people we're married, we can exclude five hundred thousand dollars of capital gain on our taxes. And if I am single, I am allowed to uh, um I'm allowed to claim $250,000, but for each person on the deed up to two. And the reason, it so let's say me and Wayne bought a house together and we've been living there. And the truth is that neither, you know, we, um, we're going to sell it. We made some money on it. I could claim 250,000 and he could claim 250,000. And the reason, it, and we're not filing jointly. We find our, file our taxes separately, but we're both on the deed. All right. So a maximum of 500, Married fi filing uh, jointly would be an automatic filing. This is based on the amount realized. And, and the we'll reason get into the amount realized in a second, okay? And the reason- but That's going to be our cost. When you bought the house, did you not pay closing costs? Sure you did. Over the last 25 years that you lived in it, did you not make capital improvements? Put a new roof on, put a new heat pump in, maybe you put a swimming pool in. All those things, you made that thing more valuable. And the reason those are all your adjusted costs, right? Those are all your basis. You paid for all of that stuff. So they shouldn't hold that against you. You shouldn't pay taxes on it again. So in that particular case, we're gonna be able to add all of those things up. So remember I said I bought it for a hundred and I um uh sold it for eight. Right and the now reason my tax liability is seven hundred thousand dollars. Because that's what I made. So I can exclude 500000 of it off automatically. Well, that still means I'm paying tax on 200000 Well, let me go back to see all the things I put into this house. And the reason... A new roof, 25000 right? All right, so I can add that in. Um, a new driveway, whatever that costs. Um, new furniture, uh, not new furniture, but um, a new garage, right? Maybe I added a garage. That would come off. Maybe I added um, landscaping in a swimming pool. That would come off. So all those things I would deduct. deduct. And if it came to one hundred fifty thousand, it got me down to fifty thousand. All right. And then now paying taxes on fifty thousand to make eight hundred, it's probably um, and the know, reason not it, too not too terrible. And the reason a capital it, gain is the amount realized, right? The profit from the sale of a real property. And the reason it short term gain is 12 months or less. And this tax, if you're only 12 months or less and you have a gain, you're going to pay raised based on your um, income bracket. So if you're at 27%, you're going to pay taxes at 27%. If it's more than 12 months and you've owned it, the rate is now currently, I believe, 20%. It started out at 15 and the reason it's gone up to 20 or vice versa. I'm sorry. Started at 20, it's gone down to 15. Depends on what the tax bracket is. Right? All right. It has to be your principal residence. It has to be where you live. Married couple filing jointly up to $500,000 tax free. It's a good thing. Single person or married filing separately up to $250,000 tax free. Up to two people on the D. So we can do it twice. And the reason... It now, the rule is that you have to have owned it for at least two years before you can claim capital gains, otherwise it's going to get taxed on your short term. 
you have to have lived in it for two years out of the past five full time. And the reason, and you could not have taken this claim in the last two years. And, and the reason you take the claim in the last two years, you had to live in it two of the last five years, right? And you've had to own the property at least two years. That's the deal. All right. That's what you, that's your rules. And the reason our cost basis, our cost basis, we paid $100,000 for the purchase price here. And the reason- And then we added another $25,000 for the co closing costs. So our cost basis would probably be somewhere around $125,000. Let's just throw that out there. And the reason- Okay. So this would be 100, and the reason would be 25. And the reason- it Yeah. I made some capital improvements. Remember I said I did all of that work out there, right? So all of the things I did, the, ro uh, the roof, the pool, the air conditioning, the HVAC system, all of those things. So let's say that you ended up to over time, um, let's say I ended up to $75,000, right? Probably more than that, but let's use that number. So I have my cost basis, which is $125,000. And I have seventy-five thousand dollars in capital improvements, and the reason, right. and the reason so that gives me two hundred thousand. And the reason, and the reason, and the reason, okay, an adjusted basis. So our purchase price is one hundred, our allowable closing costs, which is one hundred twenty, uh, which is twenty-five, and then our capital improvements. So that's going to give me an adjusted basis of two hundred thousand. So now that's my real cost of ownership here. And right. the reason it, now ordinary repairs such as painting and you know upkeep and general upkeep and maybe a new rug, and that's the reason the ordinary it, and that's not going to count as a capital contribution. But a new room, a deck, a pool, a new roof, a HVAC, all of those things would count. All right, so let's say now my cost of acquisition here is two hundred thousand. All right, let's look at the next slide. And and the reason it, now I am um, I'm going to sell this. So now remember I said that my basis before is 200,000. And the reason that's what it cost me. Well, I got to realize I got to figure out how much the um this thing's going to cost. So, I'm selling it for 800,000. And the reason and the reason and the reason I'm going to pay a 10% commission which is 80,000 and 20,000 in closing costs. So that's 100,000. All right, closing and excise and everything else. So, I'm going to subtract that hundred thousand for allowable closing costs, and the reason so now that means seven hundred thousand dollars is going to be my amount realized, and the reason and the okay. reason my realized price is going to be seven hundred, and the reason so I'm going to come here and I'm going to put my seven hundred thousand in my amount realized. I'm going to subtract what it cost me, and that means I have a five hundred thousand dollar capital gain. And the reason, and the reason, and that's really what it is. Okay, so my my sales price currently, and the reason my closing costs, right, which would be in, uh, which would be commission, which would be excise tax, which would be um, any kind of uh, sales taxes currently, any of my closing costs, right, they would all be my uh, uh, closing costs, and they would come off. They would be my amount realized. That's how much I really made. So and I the take reason off what I paid for it from what I made, I now have $500,000 capital gain. That worked out rather nicely because I can exclude all of it. And the reason, and right? the reason I can exclude all of it. And the reason and that's how it would work. I have 500,000 cause I'm married filing jointly and I could just make believe I never, I, it, nothing ever happened. If however, and the reason that some things happening here. So let's take a look at this, an example. Our original purchase price, 98,000, we had 550 in closing costs. And the reason it, we sold it 20 years later for 879,000 and 54,600 in closing costs. And the reason so, it, so about 20 years ago, we had a cost basis of $98,550, the purchase price plus the closing costs. All right. Now, currently, now this doesn't even add any capital improvements on there, all right? So we're just going to leave that as it is. And I'm the reason to sell this for eight hundred seventy-nine thousand minus my fifty-four thousand six hundred, which is my current closing cost, commissions and otherwise. 
So I'm really only going to make and the reason twenty four thousand four hundred. Well, if I take that for tax reasons and subtract what I'm going my amount realized and my cost basis, I'm going to pay seven. I'm going to have a capital gain of seven hundred twenty five thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. This is how it breaks out. If I am married filing jointly, my seventy two eight fifty capital gain minus my five hundred thousand dollar exemption. And the reason it's and the reason be it's a capital gain of two hundred twenty five thousand eight fifty. I'm going to have to pay taxes on that. No way to get around that one, right? So two twenty five eight fifty times a fifteen percent tax rate. Okay, I'm going to have a tax bill of thirty three thousand eight hundred seventy seven dollars and fifty cents. And the reason, it, which is a lot cheaper than if you multiplied seven twenty five eight fifty by fifteen percent, right? somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 some thousand dollars less. Okay. So that is how it works. And that's how you get it. Cost to purchase minus expenses or in adding in expenses, then cost to sell it minus expenses to sell it. That's going to be my net gain. And the reason, it, what's the one problem with this? And the reason, it, what do you think the one problem is? And the reason what if it, I own a vacation home, what if this is not my um, what if this is not my permanent home? And the reason it, what happens then? And the reason it, and the reason I just got to make money and pay it all to Uncle Sam. And the reason well, that it, would suck. And the reason right, it, but I can't use capital gains because it has to be my principal residence. Well, I live in um, New Hampshire. And the reason, it, but I have a cat house here on the Outer Banks. And the reason I'm going to sell it. I'm going to make money on it. What am I going to do? So if it's a second home or investment property, I got to start looking a little differently. And the reason you could do that, or you can do what's called a 1031 exchange, a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Now we didn't hear much of these lately because there wasn't a lot of profit being made on second homes and not enough to do exclusions and things of that nature. But and the reason it we can do what's called a tax deferred exchange, a 1031 tax deferred exchange. So it's like kind property for like kind property. Let's look at this video from Prep Agent. It actually gives us a little bit of an explanation as to um, what we are, um, what we're looking at. Let's finish talking about that 1031 exchange here for a second. And let me draw it up for you because this is going to be, you're going to get people who are going to be investors who are going to want to know what to do with this property because they can't do anything without this having to take place. All right, so let's say for instance, I just sold my house, I'm an investor, and I just sold my house on the beachfront, my rental property for $500,000. So I'm gonna to go to closing, and my attorney is gonna ask me what I wanna do with that money. I'm either gonna to have to pay Uncle Sam or I'm going to have to do something else with it, which is what's called a 1031 exchange. So if I say I want to do a 1031 exchange, I don't want to pay the taxes, we're going to have to take this 500000 and we're going to have to send it to an attorney, a trustee, all right, for a 1031. So there would be a 1031 trustee. So your attorney can't even hold it. We're going to send it to a third party. Now, I have 45 days from that date of closing to identify a new property, 45 days, all right, to identify a new property. And I have to close on it 180 days from then. Now, like I said in the video, it's not 45 plus 80, 180, it's 180. So what I can do is I can go out now. Usually, if you're going to sell this property, if you're going to do a 1031, you're going to be looking for property well before you close. So what happens here is I find, and it has to be real estate for real estate. It used to be prior to 2017, capital for capital. So you, if you had a boat, you could trade it for a bigger boat um, or anything else like that if you, made, if you made any kind of gains for it. But you can't do that anymore. It's got to be real estate. So. Over here, out in the middle of North Carolina, outside of Winston-Salem, we found a farmette. 
and it's a 20-acre uh, format, and we really like it. So what I want to do is I want to buy that format. It's out in the wilderness. I might just put some cows on it later, but I want to buy it. And they want $475,000 for it. And I say, okay, let's get into an exchange for that four seventy five. dollars you notice I got 500 here, and I'm only going to give them 475. Do I want to pay taxes really on that 25,000? If I take it, I got to pay taxes on it. I don't want to. So what I have here is inside that barn, they have a couple of big John Deere tractors. They're huge. And I offer up the other 25K for those two tractors. And they accept it. Now that 25, those two tractors would be called boot. And boot is the price that's of um, personal property that's above the price of the um, land, okay? So those two tractors, now if you've ever priced John Deere tractors, you know they're well over $25,000 for these two big tractors. So now I can make this exchange. So what I've done is I'm not gonna pay the taxes on the 475, I'm gonna take ownership of property. And I'm going to take the 25,000 and I'm going to, this is now what? Personal property. I'm not going to pay real estate taxes on it. I'm going to pay it on my personal property taxes, which is what? Seven or 8% versus 20 or 25%. So I can take that $25,000 and I can lower it again because I purchased this personal property with it, the boot. And I can, now I get, it gets taxed at a personal property level. And that's how we avoid most of the taxes. If I can't pay all five hundred thousand of it, which would be best, if I get a little bit of a little bit of property back, I can call it uh, its personal property, and I'll pay taxes on that. At what eight? I think eight percent personal property rate. That's what your personal property rate is, which is cheaper than twenty five percent, twenty seven percent, right? So, and that's how it works. And then the, all the uh, the trustee will send the the money to the attorney the the um, farmers. Uh, now I can keep going. So let's say I subdivide this 20 acres into 20 lots and I start selling them off, right? And maybe now I sell them off for, um, you know, maybe they're worth $20,000 an acre. I start selling them off and I'm making money. And then I can take that and I can get a bigger piece of property and keep, I can keep moving on. But the minute I take the money, the minute I take the cash, I have to pay the taxes on. So I can start building my empire by moving money, by moving houses and doing these things. However, once I cash out, once I take a little bit of that money out, I got to pay taxes. On it. So that's why it's a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Ultimately, the chickens will come home to roost and you're going to have to pay. But for now, you can keep building and growing on doing different things. And that's how it works. That's a 1031 exchange. In our remaining time, I want to make sure we understand Chapter 17 because Chapter 17 is pretty important. All right, 14, 15, 21, 17, all part of that big big squeeze there. So let's go back and do the um, questions at the end of Chapter 17 so that we make sure that we got it. And then that pretty much should bring us to the end of the night. We'll go as far as we can with this. All right? All right. Reconciliation refers to all right, I think we're doing talking appraisers now, right? That's where we're back, get our heads back there. All right, so reconciliation refers to C, analyzing the results obtained by the three different approaches to, and, uh, yeah, the three different approaches of value to arrive at a final estimate of value. The appraiser is going to look at all three approaches. They're going to pick the appropriate one, what's going to give them the best value, and that's the one they're going to use. That's reconciliation, all right? Um, one method of, to determine a building's replacement cost uses uh, the estimated cost of the raw materials needed to build the structure plus labor plus indirect costs. All right. This is a quantity survey method. We didn't talk about it in the PowerPoints. I would not worry too much about that. That's how we get the price, the replacement price. All right. So don't worry about that one. Number three. An appraiser needs certain financial figures in order to determine value by the income approach. 
Which one of the following numbers is not required for the income approach? Now, we need what? The net operating income, the annual net. We need the capitalization rate. We need the gross income. But the income approach does not depend on accrued depreciation. The cost approach might. Okay, the cost approach might, but not the income approach. Okay, not the income approach. Number four, the highest and best use of a property is the B, the most return an owner can receive for the use of that property. All right. So what's the best use of the property? What's the most return I can get from it? All right. That's what we're going to decide. It doesn't always mean more buildings. Yep. It doesn't always mean more buildings. Number five, the income capitalization approach is giving the most weight in the valuation to, um, when we're doing a capitalization approach, we would use it, oh, it would be for an office building, multiple units, rentals, right? What's coming in? How much we're bringing in? Single family residents, we're going to use a sales comparison approach. A one bedroom condominium, we're going to use the same sales comparison approach. Um, a school, we're going to use the what? The cost approach. How much to rebuild it? How much depreciation do we have? An office building would be income capitalization. Number six. Capitalization is the process by which annual net operating income is used as the basis of estimating value. So we're going to use our estimated value, right? We're going to use capitalization. What do we want as our return on investment? How much do we want as a um, an ROI or a percentage of profit? Right? That's what we need to know. Where, where are we going? Where we're supposed to be going? Number seven, the depreciation that an appraiser uses in the cost approach to value represents the loss of value due to any cause. C, it's just age. Right? Buildings go down. They're not worth as much the second day as they were the first day, much like cars, right? We lose value over time. We lose value over time. We don't want that. That happens. And that's what we're allowed to do. Number eight, the appraised value of a residence with four bedroom and one bathroom would probably be reduced because of what? Functional obsolescence. They all work, but there's just not enough of them. The function makes it extremely difficult to deal with, right? Extremely today, it's a, it's a lot. Number nine, the reason for loss of value that is always incurable is economic obsolescence, right? I can't do anything about the changing community. Those things are, you know, the changing tax structure, maybe, uh, they built an airport next to my farm property. Anything else like that. I can't change that. So it's incurable. Number 10. Which of the uh, appraisal approaches makes use of the rate of investment return? And this is going to be the income capitalization report, right? Our ROI, our, capital, our capitalization, our um, percentage of profit. Number 11, which of the following is not true about market value, all right? Now, um, A, it's the highest price a property could bring in an open market. Market value is an opinion of value by the appraiser. Market price is what the property is going to bring in an open market, okay? So what is true, the buyer and seller must be knowledgeable and acting without undue pressure, it should be an arm's length transaction, both par are, uh, parties working under no duress, and a reasonable amount of time should be allowed for full exposure to the market. All right, we gotta make sure we get all of those. Number 12, developers have just announced a new championship golf course community. Property values in the area will tend to increase due to this announcement. This is an example of the principle of anticipation, right? We used that example last week when we talked about uh, Fayetteville when they announced that they were going to put the Amazon out there. Property values went up even before they put a stick in the ground, right? Because of this principle of anticipation, they made the announcement. They always thought, all thought that people, that brown would be more valuable. Number 13. 
Which of the following statements is true of the income approach to value? The income approach. And it says that the capitalization rate has to be the estimated. It's an estimated number. It's what my I put value on my money. How much is it? What do I want in return? Number 14, in the cost approach to value, it is necessary to A, determine a dollar value for depreciation. We're going to have to figure out whether it's age over a life, effective age over a life, whether it's... Um, physical, functional, or economic depreciation, um, any of those things, we have to figure out a dollar value to that. Number 15, the subject property has two bedrooms and the comparable property has three bedrooms. The estimated value of the third bedroom is $2,500. According to the sales comparison method, the appraiser should C, deduct $2,500 from the value of the comparable property. Remember, if the comp is better than us, we take it off. If the comp is not as well as ours, we add it on. Okay, we want to make that equal to our subject property. Number 16, all of the following items should be deducted from gross income to compute net operating income except for Remember that mortgage, uh, mortgage payments and interest are debt service, and that comes off after the net, after the net. So utility bills are expenses, management expenses, repair costs. Those are in our operating expenses. Mortgage payments come off after. Number 17, if the appraiser decides to increase the capitalization rate, the market value of the property will decrease. If we want more money, and I'm only making X amount of net, that means that I need to um, do what? I need to pay less if I'm going to make that kind of money, right? If I do uh, 10000 in net, well, just to show you, in this particular case, if I do 10000 in net and I need 10%, that value is going to be what? $100,000. Well, if I don't need 10%, if I need 20%, what's going to be my value now? It's going to be $50,000, right? If I divide 10,000 by 20%. So in this particular case, if this goes up, this is going to go down, okay? And that's how it works, all right? So the more money I want as return on investment, the more less I'm willing to pay for value. Number 18, the number of years a property is expected to remain useful for its original purpose is called its economic life. How long is it going to last? What do we think? What's our best choice of that? Number 19, the formula for estimating value based on the gross rent multiplier is the rental income times the gross rent multiplier equals the estimated market value. That's pretty simple. Let's find out what the other person made per dollar of sale and rental or per dollar rental, and then just figure out what the gross rent multiplier was, how much they got paid for. Number 20, in estimating the value of real estate using the cost approach, the appraiser should A, estimate the replacement cost of the improvements. What's going to cost to redo those, right? We're using the cost approach. We need to take those out of there. Site improvements are going to come out. They don't depreciate. Land doesn't depreciate. Number 21, <laughs> under the income approach to estimating the value of real estate, the capitalization rate is the rate of return the property will earn as an investment, B. Right? That's our rate of return. That's what our cap rate is. Number 22, an example of economic obsolescence is if they shut the factory down and everybody moves away, we have abandoned buildings. Can I change that? I can't do anything about that. All right. So abandoned buildings in the area. That would be economic obsolescence. Number 23, a house is located in a suburban community. A new expressway is building built a few blocks away that will reduce the commute time to the urban employment center by 30 minutes. The house is expected to increase in value based on the principle of anticipation, right? 
we're waiting for something to happen. This is good news. Okay. So we are now want that that house is worth a little more now because of the good news coming. Number 24, the subject property is a two-story home with three bedrooms, three baths, a family room, a dining room, and an attached two-car garage. Which of the following would be a legitimate comparable sale? Um, a two-story home with three bedrooms and two and a half baths in the same neighborhood that sold 18 months ago. All right, I throw this one out because it's 18 months ago. We're trying to find six months or closer. All right, plus it's only got two and a half baths. And a one-story home, I would throw it out for that reason, in a different neighborhood with three bedrooms and two baths. Well, it doesn't have three baths. We have it. All right. A detached one-car garage. We have an attached one. This is completely different. So neither one nor two I would use. I wouldn't use either one. Okay. I would use neither one. One for age and one for just complete difference. Number 25. Which of the following statements is true of a comparative market analysis? All right. Now, letter B, it can help the seller price the property. When we're doing it, he's going to know what everything sold for. Now, it also a CMA is also good for the buyer because they'll know what to put in their offer for the property. Right. They'll know what they're offering for the property. Number 26, which North Carolina licensee may perform a broker price opinion? A full broker only. A provisional broker is not allowed to do a broker price opinion. So it is two only. You'll get to be a full broker relatively easily. Number 27, in the appraisal process, the appraiser must consider highest and best use when the appraiser A, analyzes market forces such as competition, and current versus potential uses to determine the reasonableness of the property's present use in terms of profitability, right? So he's got to have to look at all of those forces, market forces. What do we need, right? I don't need to build a high rise when I need green space or need a medical plaza or something else like that. Yeah. Federally related appraisals must follow the guidelines. They use the uniform standards of professional appraisal practices or USPAP, that's what they use. That is the appraisal guidelines here. All right, this is what you folks have been waiting for. I know. Number 29. If the gross rent multiplier in a neighborhood is $125 and the monthly rent in a duplex is $1,000 per unit, then the approximate value of the property is, okay, so what I have is a duplex here, right? So I have to remember that I have two units. So it's a thousand times two. So my monthly rent is two thousand dollars, and they're getting one hundred and twenty-five dollars per. So I'm going to multiply this by one hundred and twenty-five, and that's going to give me two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. All right. Again, one of those little one-word throw the question off. All right. It is a duplex, a duplex. Number 30, if a property's annual net income is 24,000 and it's valued at 300,000, what's the capitalization rate? Put it in your T, right? Put it in your T. We have 24,000, which is our net, and our value is 300,000. What are we making on our money? We're making 8%, right? We're going to divide this. We're going to make 8%. Hmm. That's how you do it. This is net. This is the value. This is our um, ROI, return on investment. Number 31, a 20-year-old well-maintained building has an estimated replacement cost of $100 per square foot. The building has 200,000 uh, yeah, 2, square feet. Land value is estimated at 350000 Based on an inspection of the building, the appraiser estimates that the building has an effective age of 10 years and a useful life of 40 years. 
Site improvements, including underground utilities and landscaping, have an estimated value of 130000 Using the cost approach, an appraiser would estimate the value of the property as what? Well, the first thing is we have, let's do this. Remember our age over life method that we were talking about earlier? All right, so we have 10 years divided by 40 is what we expect the useful life to be. So this is going to be what? 0.25? Will everybody agree to that? 0.25. All right, so now let's go and find out what we have to do here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply 2,000 times 100, $100, because that's what it says up top, 100 per square foot, 2,000 square foot. So our replacement cost for this building is going to be 200,000. All right. Okay, now i got to figure out my depreciation. So if I look at this, I'm going to multiply out, I'm going to find 25% of that 200,000. That's going to be my depreciation. So we're going to say 200,000 times 25%, 0.25, and that's going to give us 50,000 for depreciation. So we have to take that off, right? So our depreciated reproduction cost is going to be 200000 minus the $150,000, uh, the $50,000, I'm sorry, $50,000. So that means our depreciated reproduction cost, 150000 Now, that's the reproduction cost. But I also have to add back the land. Right? So if I add back the land, I got to add the land value is $350,000. And the site improvements are going to be $130,000. That's what it says in the question. So I'm going to add all these together because land and site improvements don't depreciate. So when I add those three together, I'm going to get $630,000. And that's going to be my value, my cost approach value. So I took the cost to rebuild it, okay? The cost to rebuild it, 100 by 2,000. Um, I did the, I, so I multiplied that out up here. Then I figured out the depreciation, which with using an age over life is 10 over 40. So that's 25%. That's what I did over here. All right. So 50,000 was depreciated. So now my value really is only 150,000 for the rebuild. Add back the land for 350, add back the site improvements for 130. Adding all of those together, the value I'm going to put on that property is $630,000. Question number 32. The subject property has 2,100 square feet, four bedrooms, two car garage, no patio, no pool, two and a half baths, and sits on one acre. The comparables recently sold for 140000 and has 100, uh, 1,900 square feet, three bedrooms, a one-car garage, a patio, a pool, two baths, and sits on 1.5 acres. And we have market cost data. So let's do this. In this particular line, let's put all of our subject properties. So this is our subject. Okay, we have what? We have 2,100 2, heated square feet, right? 2,100 square feet. We have four bedrooms. We have a two-car garage. We have no pool. We have no patio or no patio, no pool, either way. All right. No patio. We have 2.5 baths. And what else we got? 1.5 acres, right? 1.5 acres. All right. So that is our subject property. Let's redo this. Let's look at our comparative property now. Let's change the color so we can see it. 
All right, our comparative. Let's see what they got. They have. Um, all right, they sold for 140,000. 40, so the first thing we're going to do is make 140,000. We know that. That's what they sold for. Now, 1,900 heated square feet. They have three bedrooms. They have a one car garage. Um, they have, um, let's see what else they have. One patio, one pool. All right, so one pool, we put it first, one patio. That's okay. It's all the same. Two and a half baths. All right. It has um, one car, two baths. Two baths. Right. And it sits on what? 1.5 acres. So it ought to do much with that. Okay. Well, now we have some values. So my comp is 200 square feet less than my subject property. So what do I have to do here? I have to bump that up a little bit, right? So adjustments to my comp. What am I going to make? I am going to say that we have um, $72 a square foot. So 72 times 200 is going to be what? We're going to add 14,400, right? We have to add that. We also have to add a bedroom. And the bedroom is plus 2,000, right? We have four, they have two. Running. We have a two-car garage, they have a one-car garage. We have to add one garage. So that's going to be plus 1,500. We have no pool, they have a pool. We have to take off some, uh, a pat or a patio, right? Or a pool, either one. The pool is worth 14,000, so we are going to take off 14,000. We do not have a pool. They do. We uh, we do not have a patio. They do. We have to take off 2,000. That's the value of a patio. A bathroom, a half a bath is worth 800 bucks. So we have to add back a half a bath for them because they only got two. We have two and a half. Plus 800. Our subject property, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It sits on one acre. They sit on one and a half acre, so we will correct that. Assume this is one acre, all right? So a half an acre, if, an acre, if one acre is 30,000, a half acre is going to be, what, 15,000? So therefore, um, we have to take away $15,000 from them because they have more than that we do. All right, so that's going to be a minus. So we take all of this... We take our 140,000, we do our additions and subtractions, and it comes to my comparative value, 127,700, all right? So the best way you can do this is just lay it out like we did it here. That's gonna be the best way you can do it. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.